Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this house of worship. Welcome to this sanctuary. Welcome one and all into the nearer presence of God. May Christ's spirit fill your hearts this day. May you find joy and faith for your journey. And may you come to an even deeper sense that God loves you, each and every one of you. And if your heart be troubled, may you find peace. The kind of peace that can only come from God. The kind of peace that captures the troubled heart and refuses to let it go. Now, did you know that according to the Christian calendar, today marks the beginning of the last week of the current Christian year? Reign of Christ Sunday. That's what we commonly refer to it as. Or Christ the King Sunday. It is today that we are asked to reflect upon how God's realm of grace and of love, into which we are all invited, differs from the the greed, the violence, and the oppression that we witness in the world around us. And we'll begin this reflection this morning with a call to worship that I believe captures an essential truth about God's realm. In the midst of the jangling demands of life that wear us down, we as God's children are loved from God's very center. In the midst of discord and of squabbles between us, we as God's children are loved toward loving each other. In the midst of cultural dissonance, we as God's children are loved toward harmony. And so we gather at the call from God, God the great conductor, to sing of sacrificial love in notes of concord and harmony. We gather at the call from God we gather at the call from love. Let us pray. God, in this time of worship, open us to the truth about your realm, that we may be led deeper into what it means for us. May our hearts and minds be open to the stories of love, the words of life and the vision of your realm that you would want us to have. May Christ's spirit reign over us and draw us closer to you. Amen. And we'll now continue to worship the Lord our God, only now we'll do so with music. Okay, our anthem this morning is Near the Cross by Joel Rainey.
Now, before I call Natalie up to give a message for our children, is Natalie here? Oh, there she is. I didn't see you way back there. Before I uh, call Natalie up, I just want to um, just speak a few words to the children myself this morning, wherever they may be out in the uh, Ethernet. Um, I just want to give a fair warning to them about being very careful about what you wish for. Okay? And this is in the form of a funny parable, a very short, funny parable. Well, I think it's funny. So the kids, for the kids who are listening this morning, please take heed to these words. A young kid found an old lamp. And as always, the lamp was rubbed, eh? and a genie appeared, granting three wishes. The genie said, I will grant you three wishes. To which the kid replied, I wish math never existed. Done, the genie said, you have no more wishes. Do you get it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing under here. Come on. Are you, I hope you're laughing too. <laughs> Natalie, come on. <laughs> Can't wait to see you, kids. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, I really liked that joke because that would be something I'd wish for as a kid. I really hated math. Um, so it is Reign of Christ Sunday, which that just sounds really cool to me, um, just the sound of it, reign of Christ. Um, so I want you guys to think about who Jesus is to you. Who is he? See, this was a big question for everybody when Jesus was living here on earth. Um, every place he traveled to, that was the buzz. Everyone was talking about who this guy is. Who is Jesus? Um, and then when he came to the Roman Empire, this governor named Pontius Pilate, he was a pretty big name there. He actually was very curious because he kept hearing um, everyone say that he's the king of the Jews. So he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And this was a big deal that Jesus answered that yes, he is because that would be that Jesus is more important than the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was the top dog. They were like, I don't know, they were like Beyonce. Like they were everything. <laughs> so for Jesus to say that he's more important, it really like was crazy to people. Now, today we know that Jesus is king, um, and it's very apparent in our everyday Christian lives, but I want you to think about who is someone really, really cool to you. Maybe it's a YouTuber, or uh, somebody on TikTok, or somebody in a TV show you like. You think they're so cool, and you know, you listen to what they have to say. Well, what if I told you that what Jesus has to say is way more important than that person. Now, that might make you think, like, whoa, well, that's crazy, because what I think this YouTuber says is, like, amazing. But it's true. What Jesus has to say is so much more important. And I'll tell you why. Because he loves us like nobody can here on earth. And he will listen to us. He wants to hear about us. Now, I'm sure like if you were to meet your YouTuber, she or he would want to listen to you, but not in the way that Jesus would. Jesus would listen to you talk for days on end, where I don't know anybody that would do that in real life. So Jesus is king because he rules our hearts and he believes in us, loves us, and wants the best for us. So why wouldn't we go and talk to him? Why wouldn't we want to call him king, right? So I challenge you guys, um, next time that 
you're feeling like you need a little confidence boost or you know you just want somebody to talk to go to Jesus and talk to him because I'm like telling you right now 100% you'll feel way better you'll come out feeling like you just went to a Beyonce concert you'll be glowing because Jesus loves you and he'll listen to you all night and it's just a great feeling I really want you guys to experience it so that's my challenge for you guys um, and that is really my whole message um, so maybe it's something you guys can talk about um, who Jesus is or maybe even read that passage about Pontius Pilate asking Jesus um, yeah and that is really it for me this week I missed you guys so much when I was on my break and I'm really excited to uh, get talking to you guys again and um, I know you guys are all at home but I can't wait to see some of you guys in the pews um, as the weeks come on but that's it for me and I hope you guys have a great week you guys stay safe and I'll talk to you next week bye thank you Natalie let us now bring to God our brokenness our hurts, our grief, and our failings, trusting that God can give us peace. Let us pray. God of all compassion, we place in your hands the tangled web that is our human lives. By your loving and ever-present mercy, Forgive and remove from us that which is sinful. Untwist that which is tangled. Free that which is knotted. Mend that which is broken. And bring balance and harmony into our daily existence. In the name of Christ Jesus we pray. The same Christ who calls to us. Follow me and choose to live my way. The same Christ who taught us to pray as one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God is, is always, always calling us, seeking us. God is always ready to receive us. Right? I believe that our true home is with God and in God. So welcome home. You're going to recognize the passage of scripture I'm about to read. In fact, Natalie read portions of it just a minute ago. It's a tricky one. It's a very tricky one. But we're going to look at it closely this morning to see whether we can glean some insight into what constitutes real truth. Or put another way, God's truth. Okay? So reading now from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John, and I'm reading from the 18th chapter. Listen for what God is trying to tell you. Pilate went back into the palace and he called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus answered, does this question come from you or have others told you about me? Pilate replied, you think I'm a Jew? It was your own people 
and the chief priests who handed you over to me, what have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No, my kingdom does not belong here. So Pilate asked him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born and came into this world for this one purpose, to speak about the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. It smacks of a, of a court scene, doesn't it? An arraignment, perhaps? Like the ones you see on all those law and order shows, you know? Dun dun. Right? Jesus, the defendant, is standing in front of Pilate, the judge. Pilate states the charge. People claim that you are the king of the Jews. And then he asks, is this true? How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Just the facts, please. I want only the truth. Now, how do you plead? But folks, the truth that Pilate seeks is very different from the truth to which God sent Jesus into the world to tell. And that's part of what I want to talk about this morning. You see, Pilate thinks of truth in intellectual terms. And I think for the most part we do too. Pilate thinks of truth in terms of reliable and dependable and provable facts. Two plus two equals four. Rome is the world's superpower, and I am the highest ranking representative of Rome in Judea. Now, are you the king of the Jews or not? And as I said before, we tend to think of truth in much the same way. Two plus two equals four. The earth is round, not flat. And today's dominating superpower is a divided nation. That's the truth, many would claim. Those are reliable, dependable, and provable facts. But it's not how Jesus sees the truth. Trust me. Jesus sees the truth in theological terms. Jesus sees the truth as moving beyond mere facts toward an unwavering conformity to God's will. Jesus sees truth as action, positive action, as something that is done, not simply believed or thought. In fact, Jesus sees truth as acting righteously as opposed to acting unrighteously. Is this making sense? And he sees this theological truth Right? This holy truth, call it God's truth, as taking precedence over all other human understandings of truth. It's number one. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not an either-or situation. Please, don't think that. 
We need intellectual truth to help create order out of chaos, don't we? We need it to maintain many of our social norms. If not for this intellectual truth, we could not coexist together. We need it. But let's be honest, intellectual truth does not satisfy all our needs. We must go beyond only the reliable, dependable, and provable facts in this world. Jesus tells us that we must seek to know God, right? And to love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all our strength. And we're to live as God's agents of love in the world, loving and helping our neighbor. We talked about that last week. Jesus teaches that God's holy truth ought to move us toward faithful witness. Right? Toward faithful living. Move us. God's truth is not just meant for contemplation. We need to understand it. God's truth is something we do. God's truth involves being kind to everyone we meet. God's truth involves loving our enemy and forgiving our friend. God's truth involves standing up for what is right. Which leads me to the second thing I want to talk about this morning. And that is doing what is right despite the cost. Doing what is right as a key feature, a focal feature of God's truth. Or to rephrase, how about this? Doing what is right always and in every circumstance as the ultimate way of living into God's truth. Now, in many versions of the Bible, the passage I just read, they give it a loose title. They call it the trial before Pilate. Jesus' trial before Pilate. I think a better title might be Pilate on trial. Let me tell why. Pilate knows that Jesus shouldn't be on trial. He doesn't even know what Jesus has done. Pilate is responsible for maintaining Roman rule in Judea, Roman order, right? But he doesn't consider Jesus a threat to that rule. A few verses earlier when speaking to the Jewish leaders, Pilate suggests that they take him themselves and judge Jesus according to Jewish law. So why, here's the question, why in the end does Pilate try Jesus? He finds no case against him, but then have him flogged and crucified. Huh? The most highly esteemed representative of the superpower of the ancient world. Something strange is going on here. What is Pilate's goal? That's what I ask in this sham trial. What's his goal? What is he trying to achieve? Pilate probably sees himself as the most powerful and most in control person in Jerusalem. There's no doubt of that. He's the local delegate, as I said before, of the greatest power in the world at that time, and that's Rome. So he himself holds the power to release Jesus or to kill him. 
However, those supposedly in control, I believe Pilate is trapped in fear. Pilate is trapped in fear. He's supposedly in control. But it ain't working for him. And here's why I say that. The Jewish leaders want Jesus put to death. If Pilate doesn't give them what they want, Pilate wonders, can he remain in control? Does he have enough troops to quash the trouble these temple authorities might stir up after the fact? And, probably more importantly, how would all this play back in Rome, right? On his watch, if Pilate is unable to keep the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. <laughs> so when Pilate summons Jesus and asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that really the question he's asking? Does Pilate really believe that Jesus is a rebel, an insurrectionist? Or is he trying to find some technicality on which to condemn Jesus and thus satisfy the bloodthirst of the Jewish authorities? Is Pilate free, really free? Or is he, in fact, all knotted up in his effort to stay in control? In fact, is that not Pilate's real goal? To stay in control regardless of the cost. Our poor friend Pilate is trapped. Pilate is on trial. Pilate has to hide what he really thinks and set aside what he really wants to do. And that is to set Jesus free. Because Pilate is deathly afraid of the consequences of doing so. Pilate, my friends, is far, far, far away from living in God's truth. Pilate is on the verge of surrendering his soul in his manipulation of mere human truth. So, right about now you may be asking yourselves, what the heck does all this mean for me? Oh, fine and dandy, you yakking up there, Frank the Rev. What does it mean for me? In what way is this passage relevant to me? Well, I'll tell you why with an example. An example, in fact, of why this passage may be making some of us feel fearful and trapped ourselves. Consider, for example, our politicians, some of whom are modeling their political maneuverings and campaigns after those Republican politicians in the U.S. who are now card-carrying members of the Trump cult. Yeah, Canadian politicians who, in their weakness and fear, are choosing to emulate Republican leaders in the U.S. like McConnell, Cruz, Hawley, McCarthy, the whole gang. In an effort to secure power rather than live in God's truth. Rather than stand up for what is right regardless of the cost. These politicians are afraid. They feel trapped. 
And so are we if we look the other way and support them. The only goal of these politicians is to gain or maintain power. And they're willing to jettison truth, integrity, and decency to do so. But evidence of this captivity doesn't rest only with politicians. It can be seen in the pews of many congregations as well. And when I say pews, I include this little one too. Maybe we're all captive in one way or another. Think of this. In mainline churches, most members have every creature comfort imaginable. Houses and cars and expensive vacations. Yet, dare these members be authentic at work, at their place of employment, or their place of volunteering, or wherever, or in the public square in general? Dare they reveal, dare we reveal, who we truly are and what we truly believe? Or at least dare to speak, to speak about the holy ideals to which we have been called and toward which we have committed ourselves to travel? Are we squirming a little bit? Or are we feeling trapped by a fear of losing social or economic status? Does our position in society or the creature comforts to which we have been called or become accustomed prevent us from living authentically and with integrity in God's truth? It's a tough question we're forever having to ask ourselves. Must we hide ourselves and do and say things that we don't really want to say and do in order to, quote, remain in control? On this Sunday, on this final Sunday of the current Christian year, the church proclaims that Christ is king and that it will bow only to him. The church declares that it does not give allegiance to any other person, principality, or power claiming to be sovereign. Most important, the church prays that the heart of Jesus will remain and reign forever in our hearts. But here's the $64,000 question. Will the church live out its proclamation? Will we, as members of the church, live out its proclamation? Forever fearful in this post-Christian era, and that's what it is, forever fearful of losing membership and thus of losing whatever measure of influence that may remain, in this community that we may enjoy, will the church temper its message? Right? Or distort it in any sort of way? In a desperate effort to maintain its position and its viability? Fear and the feeling of being trapped, these are terrible things. Pilate felt trapped. Many politicians today feel trapped. 
Many Christians feel trapped by the society in which they live, a society that indulges consumerism and individualism instead of fostering the common good and the well-being of all. Let's call it what it is. Let's be real. Indeed, the church can feel trapped. But it doesn't have to. And as members of the church, the constituents of the church, we don't have to either. That is my great hope. We can choose to live in God's holy truth. We can choose to center our lives in God's holy truth. We can choose to live with integrity in God's truth. We can choose to do God's truth. Right? By living the sacred way that Jesus taught. We can allow the heart of Jesus to forever reign within our hearts. We can choose that. It's a conscious choice. One to which we're all called. We're all called to make that choice. You can't duck it. Pray that we choose wisely. In fact, let us do just that. Let's pray. Holy God, the God of Jesus and of all. Jesus said, whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. Lord, help us to hear his words once again, we pray. Amidst the noise and the clamor of our culture, amidst the yells and the shouts of hatred in what is becoming a divided society, help us to hear once again his timeless message of love and live in the way he has taught In a society divided in its politics, divided in its race relations, divided in its economic equality, divided in its treatment of neighbor, help us to hear once again Jesus' timeless message of love. Help us, God, to live into your truth, to do what is kind, to do what is compassionate and forgiving, to do what is right despite the cost. God, help us to hear once again Jesus' timeless message of love and live in the way he is taught. May Christ's heart forever reign in our hearts. Amen. Let it be so. Listen now to Krista Stolarski. She sings beautifully the hymn, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Mercy keep it 
by morning glow or evening shade his watchful eye ne'er sleepeth within the kingdom of his might though all is just and all is right to god all praise and glory The Lord is never far away, but through all grief distressing, an ever-present help and stay, our peace and joy and blessing. As with a mother's tender hand, He leads His own, His chosen band, to God all praise and glory. Thus all my toilsome way along I sing aloud His praises That men may hear the grateful song My voice unwearied raises Be joyful in the Lord, my heart Both soul and body bear your part To God all praise and glory On the cross, above his head, were written the words, This is the King of the Jews. But as the way Jesus envisioned God's kingdom, the same as the way people envisioned it. Let us pray. When Christ's way of love rules, the world rejoices. No child goes to bed hungry or is without a safe home. World leaders respond to people's yearning for peace. Earth resources are carefully conserved for future generations. Prisoners are healed and educated rather than beaten and punished. All people are recognized for whatever gifts they are able to share. We will bring closer the rule of Christ, one issue at a time, one person at a time. When Christ's way of love rules, the suffering ones rejoice. No man or woman is afraid to walk the streets. An appropriate job is available for each person who wants one. The services of competent doctors and timely surgeries are available for all. Older persons are respected and their wisdom cherished. Those in pain find relief and the dying have peace. We pray for family members, friends and members of this church who are sick at home or in the hospital. When Christ's way of love rules, those who have lost loved ones know close support. We think of those who have suffered loss and those who comfort them.
We will bring closer the rule of Christ, one issue at a time, one person at a time. When Christ's way of love rules, the church rejoices. Faith community members lift their hearts and voices in songs of faith. The life of the Spirit is a cherished part of everyday life. And the lives of the saints are honored and followed. Christian scriptures and sacred writings of other faith groups are valued and studied. Church members appreciate that their Christian faith is crucial to their lives and the life of the local community. The needs of faith communities overseas are recognized and supported. We will bring closer the rule of Christ, one issue at a time, and one person at a time. When Christ's way of love rules, each one of us rejoices. We proclaim our faith and share it unabashedly with those who are critical or scornful. We are companions of the downtrodden and advocates for those who are denied justice. We listen quietly for God to speak to us. We give thanks for the graceful gifts that are ours in family and in our friendships. We trust that the love of God goes with us into the hard places of life and when life ends. We will bring closer the rule of Christ with heart and soul and mind and spirit and strength, indeed with our whole being. Let this be our prayer and our commitment and may the heart of Jesus reign forever in our hearts. Amen. Listen now to a wonderful arrangement of the hymn, The King of Love, by Gonzalo Gonzalez. King of Love.
your road, your way, your path lies before you. The way you choose, the way you choose to go is of course your choice alone. I encourage you to choose the way of the Good Shepherd, the way of love. I encourage you to put your trust in the one who loves you most. And as you journey, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk the road with you. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go in peace. Oh.